Please listen carefully. Yeah, and I almost joined a cult once. <laughs> a TikTok cult. What's up, sisters? Welcome back to another episode of Everyone and Their Sister. I'm Christina. I'm Natasha. And I'm Stephanie. Thank you so much for joining us for this very special after school program episode. Uh, (laughs) We have made it in the big times for the first time. We're so excited, guys. (laughs) We have not just ourselves on this episode. Not just people that we know in real life who we con into uh, picking books to debate about on this episode. We have an actual best-selling author. New York Times best-selling author. Real best-selling author is what that means. (laughs) Courtney Summers has joined us after we talked to her something like two years ago about the possibility of like, oh my God, can we get her on the show? And she was like, yes. And then we're like, okay, cool. We're going to dip for one full year. Uh, We're not going to release any episodes. We're going to come back. We're going to release weekly episodes to prove that we're actually releasing episodes. And then we'll come at you again for her newest release, The Project, which is releasing on February 2nd. So we got a chance to sit down and talk with her about it. And we're super excited for our listeners because it is releasing today. So a lot of people may not have had the chance to read it. Nat, what was the project about? So the project is about Lo and B. After a tragic accident kills most of her family, B. Denim is determined not to lose the one thing she has left, her little sister Lo. But Lo's injuries are catastrophic and nothing short of a miracle can save her now. When B's desperate pleas fall on Lev Warren, the charismatic spiritual leader of the Unity Project, he knows he can help. All B has to do is believe. When Lo awakes in the ICU, her parents are dead and her sister has joined the Unity Project, which is like a great way to wake up, of course. Uh, Abandoning Lo in the care of her great aunt. The more Lo learns, the more she's convinced the beloved group is hiding sinister secrets as it would. If only she could make B believe that. Years later, when a man claims the Unity Project killed his son, Lo sees the perfect opportunity to expose the group and finally reunite with her sister, B. But her investigation will put her in the direct path of Lev Warren, and he will make her question everything she thought she knew to be true and all that she believes. That was a great read um, of the, the book. I think it covers all the, the major points for sure. Um, we're super excited to get a chance to talk about it today. And before we start off our interview with Courtney, which we will sort of cut into after this part, we just wanted to talk a little bit about what we thought about the book and what we liked about it, because I think Courtney Summers always delivers, um, with something really excellent. I don't think the project was any different. Um, so Steph, what were your thoughts? Uh, it was devastation excellence as we have come to know. I mean, I personally love anything related to cults i love learning about cults i love reading about cults i love watching about cults so reading about this made-up unity project hit every box that i was looking for and on a personal note it's about a sister story which you know i can relate to as well as having a sister so i really enjoyed it i'll jump in um i think yeah again you said like sister story love it it feels very similar to sadie in that sense where like it's about sisters and a sister trying to save the other um, I think what I really liked about it was like this like nefarious undertone of familiarity throughout the whole book. Like I felt uncomfortable the entire time I was reading and I couldn't exactly pinpoint why I was so uncomfortable, um, which made me enjoy it, even though it made me miserable in the end. <laughs> not This is not like a spoiler or anything. It's just like the whole time I was miserable. Um, it's a miserable reading experience. Highly recommend <laughs> that's essentially what I'm saying but it's worth it uh every single word is worth it as you're sort of watch, as you're sort of reading it I think what was interesting about this one is I don't find anything that happens in it greatly surprising I don't think there's a big twist at the end I think there's a very natural build up to where you end up in this story and what I think is so interesting about that in this perspective is when talking about cults and you know we watch a lot of true crime about cults like I'm same boat with Steph I just watched the Nixium uh, documentary, mm-hmm. the like series. So I'm like heavily invested, very interested. But Courtney actually mentioned this in the interview that we did with her that it's always very much presented as like a spectacle. And I think that's true. Like it's 
every time you think of somebody who is in a cult and you see them in media, they're often portrayed in a very specific way. So being in the head of a character like B, who is actually in this cult and understanding her path to being there, you know, she's the character that you have empathy for, that you feel fully, you know, along with all the other characters too. So it was very humanizing to not have that perspective of like, how did you end up in this cult? Like, how did they trick you? What happened to them? Because you know exactly what happened. You see people being taken advantage of. And it makes, again, it's an absolutely devastating read because of course it is. Um, but it just humanized the topic in a really interesting way. And I think it just made it one of those ones that even though there's no big twist, I find, I find like, again, everything is very, makes sense as it's told of exactly where you end up. I think you can kind of see some of the things coming, but it's the seeing them coming that makes you tense. It's like you inhale on that very first page and you do not exhale until the end because you are just tense the entire time. And the project was so good at being tense, even when nothing tense was happening. And like, as much as I am mad at people for getting into cults and like being part of that kind of group, I completely understand how you can wrap wrapped up. And as you'll hear later on, yeah, I probably would get sucked into a cult. I'm free to admit that. Um, and the progression of both B and low, it makes total sense to me. And like really seeing that as you said, not as a spectacle, but as like something that's like happening in someone's like really normal mundane life is really interesting. And I was excited to explore that when I was reading this. And yeah, you have to read it in one go. It honestly kind of reminded me like not to like offshoot too much, um, kind of like QAnon, just putting that out there. Mm. The subtleness of it and how it ropes people in. I would actually say too, um, if you end up reading the project, which we highly recommend you do, again, it released today, so you can absolutely go and get it right now, wherever you choose to buy your books. Stop what you're doing, Um, go and buy it. Absolutely. And you can listen to this episode without having read the book yet. We did try to keep it spoiler free. There is a section where we get a little bit into it and we'll tag that so you can go ahead and take a listen. But again, I, this is such a quick book read too as well. You could literally buy it today. You could read it today and then you can listen to this episode. So those should be your Tuesday plans. Forget work. You're at home anyway. Who's going to know the difference? No one. So we're about to cut into our interview with Courtney Summers. We hope you guys enjoy it. And we will catch up with you again at the very end of this episode, uh, just to sign off. All right. Well, thank you so much, Courtney, for joining us. We're so excited to have you on the podcast. We are huge fans of your books. And we really just want to take a moment to say thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been like a long time in the works. You know, this is like an epic moment. I've been waiting for this. (laughs) We also, like, even though it's 100% because of us that it did not happen until now, uh, we've been waiting <laughs> for it since Sadie, for sure. Because I remember we talked about Sadie and I was like, this book is so good. Uh, that was the one that was like, you have to read this book. She got it somehow six months before it came out. Yeah. And so we were just like, oh, okay, great. Thanks. Now we all have to wait. Um, but we're so excited <laughs> to finally have you back when your book after Sadie is releasing. Um, the so timing talk- works. Exactly. I mean, it all worked out. That's, that's the important thing. And, and what is it like deferred gratification? That's what you have to teach kids. Like it's good to wait. And then the rewards are even greater. <laughs> this go. is better than it ever could have been if we had done it when we thought we were going to. Exactly. We're on the ball. No one will have to wait for this because we are releasing this episode on the same day that your book is releasing. Oh my gosh. So if they somehow didn't have early access to the project, they can now go get it immediately. They absolutely should. Yes. And then come back, listen to this episode. Like that's absolutely the chain of events that needs to happen. I I approve of this. Courtney Summers endorses that. (laughs) Yes. And we just have some questions we want to get through. We were huge fans of the book, which is not surprising. And we definitely have a couple of things we wanted to ask about it. Uh, It was one of those things we knew what we were looking at going into it. It's like, okay, it's Courtney Summers. We're in an emotional place. We're ready to be devastated. We're ready to be miserable and enjoying every moment of it. I'm so happy if you're upset. (laughs) But it's like, bring to me the worst of your emotions. That's how I feel I've succeeded. If you ever walk away from one of my books happy, like don't tell me, I'll I'll be crushed. (laughs) Okay, we're gonna start pretty basic while reading the the cult that you bring up is called the unity project and thought it was such a unique because it does sound like a community but it doesn't quite sound quite like a cult so I was just wondering like how did you come up with the name for the cult the unity project I remember I was just like really sweating it and I was complaining to all my friends I actually think I think Veronica Roth might have helped me think that up oh really yeah she was uh, yeah I think she might have thrown that out there um or 
or it was like a joint effort. I don't know. I, I might be severely undercrediting her if I say that I thought it up. But I want to say she had a hand in it because we were going back and forth. Like I remember I was just like, what can you call it? Because you don't want it to be something that sounds absurd. Like you don't want someone to be like, oh, there's the, the house of bad things, you know? Like there's, there's like a really fine line to walk with the cult name, I think, because mm -hmm. either it sends up a ton of red flags or it's a place you want to go and hang out. There is no in between. <laughs> It's like a false sense of comfort. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess like, I guess on that note, do you have like a writing community that you write with? Like, I'm assuming Veronica Roth is part of them. I, yeah, I have, uh, I have like a handful of friends in YA and we're always constantly swapping uh, ideas and sharing work when we're stuck and, and things like that. It's, well, you know, writers get intense. It's just a lot of like <laughs> screaming about what is my book doing and how can we fix it, basically. I guess like nothing has changed because of the pandemic because it would have been probably long distance anyway. Yeah, it's actually, yeah, that's the one thing that has remained unchanged. Well, actually, I say that like I go outside a lot anyway, which I don't. <laughs> so, I mean, all things considered, I'm very grateful that I haven't been put in a position that has compromised me in the way that so many people have because of our wonderful leadership. Okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> Not to get too political. Not to get too political. <laughs> So what cults did you look to to write the book? Like what influenced this? It was, it was definitely um, inspired by People's Temple, Jonestown, Jim Jones. Uh, the mm -hmm. People's Temple was a really interesting cult because it started out as a church and it appealed to people's better nature. So uh, if you wanted to change the world, if you believed in civil rights, if you thought people should be fed, dressed, um, sheltered, and have free access to health care, they would have likely appealed to you. And like, I mean, who doesn't want those things? You don't, you don't say, oh, he wants a better world for me. Who wants that? Like, he really got people in uh, on their best intentions. Like, he, he really made them believe they could change the world. And for a while, they were doing a lot of good. And then it was just totally perverted by his uh, utter madness in the end. It, it was incredibly tragic. And that really, that really got to me because I think when we think of cults, we think of like, Oh, there's the bunker on the hill and that guy believes that the world's going to end and, and he's got like a bunch of wives or something like that. You know, like it, it's so obviously different from what we all think of our day to day lives as being. But the, the People's Temple was very integrated into its community and it was they had powerful friends. They they were just everywhere and, and it was very insidious and very normal and very well intentioned. Yeah, it's kind of like nerve wracking to think that something that even maybe you believe in could be something that you can fall into not knowing like how can you tell them apart from like a normal group and I think right. that's like the question that comes up even when you're reading the project do you even like do you think like like what's a fandom you're really passionate about oh god <laughs> you, know, so you have many. an answer to that so don't don't ask me about this <laughs> what? I'm gonna ask you about it it honestly depends on daily basis but I absolutely know what you're talking about immediately and Stephanie said that because our last time we recorded I was talking about the magicians for like 30 minutes because I just got in and I was like no you don't understand I'm invested now I'm here now it has me but like it's like everything can walk that line from something that is like good and positive and and doing something great in your life to something that you just you, you know it's not healthy anymore. That was me and Supernatural. No, I was just about to say, is this related to? Because I know you're in the Supernatural kingdom. Well, it ended. It, it. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> the way these things can hurt us. Sometimes you just gotta oh, walk away. I like. I. I was so upset. I. I cried for like two days. It's. I was like this. Show, I was like I'm fine. That might not have been the ending that I wanted, but I. You know, I was along for the ride, and I, I do appreciate the ride that it took me on. But I was like. Like one, like the next day, I was like in tears, and I'm like, I'm not fine. <laughs> <laughs> Took me like two days to get through that. I mean, that's a big one. That's like eleven years of a life. Yeah, fifteen. But I only, I, oh. I came in at like, I came in at season eight, so I don't feel. Well, no, well, I fully invested, like as if I had given fifteen years of my life. So what am I saying? That show cost me a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, if if you betray me, I don't even want to think about how much money I've spent on the show. I, I swear Supernatural is the thing that introduced me to Tumblr to begin with and like all like the little Tumblr cults on there too. Right? They were like, so it was like every year Jensen Ackles was like the most Tumblr actor in Supernatural yeah. and then Destiel was the, and, and then it ended 
supernatural and then like every week for a week after it ended some new stuff was happening with it that was like dramatic and and like faith shaking it's like oh there's a dub where Des or where like castiel tells dean that he loves him and dean says i love him back it's like what is this show trying to do to me i barely survived it anyway <laughs> I like we're we're all just low key in different cults. It just depends Basically. on the like, yeah. How, yeah. like how much does it affect your everyday life, really? Everyone and their cult. sister's cult. Oh, that's my cult. Yeah, that's that's what we're going for. I was, I was so while I was reading this book, the cult that I kept thinking of because I think it was the most recent one that I was into was Nexium, and I'm just like, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's like a subtle there's a subtle nod to Nexium in there because I did start out researching very broadly before I zeroed in on People's Temple. And uh, I can't say what the subtle reference is to because it's a spoiler. Ooh. I'm starting to think back. I'm like, do I? Oh, I think. <laughs> <laughs> when we were talking about this, like, earlier, Christina was saying that all she could picture was love as Keith Raniere, I believe. Okay, that offends me, though. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It was one of those things where, like, it almost didn't matter how he was described because immediately in my head, I was like, there we are. It was, I've seen him recently. He was a cult leader. And every so often it would come up and I'd be, and for things I won't talk about because of spoiler related reasons, stuff would happen. And I was like, I don't want to picture that. I don't want to. I don't want I don't you want to, to either. <laughs> I had a very specific vision because see I was so scared people would superimpose their own cult leaders on lab like I went out of my and I'm I don't think of myself as the most like facially descriptive writer like it took a while before my books like I was more like hair and like I, I don't know I used to picture my characters as like hands I really did and for like the first three of my books I talk about hands a lot it's very strange like there's nail polish and all the rage and like um parker snaps her fingers i just thought of my characters as walking hands so i'm like i'm gonna make a real effort here with lev and you pictured keith Renya anyway <laughs> it's absolutely on me because it happens to me with every book someone will be like oh he was a blonde man and i'll be like okay it's chris hemsworth <laughs> like it does like i'm just like okay we're casting we're casting for the movie <laughs> Do you want to know who he'd be cast as in the movie? It wouldn't be Keith Manning. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's Oscar Isaac. He was like, oh, uh, like a total inspiration. If I was part of any fan group. <laughs> I think that like now we have to actually tell people to listen to this first so that they can make sure they're picturing Oscar Isaac. I agree while with they're that. Reading it too. I agree yeah. with that. No one should have to go through what you went through. <laughs> I would immediately join a cult. <laughs> I had to send a, a Pinterest board of the mood of the project to my publisher so they could start figuring out how they were going to make their social assets. And I had like, it was so, I had like one, just one picture of I Oscar Isaac for that. And for some reason, all the recommended pins were just Oscar Isaac after that. So like my marketing manager would log in and she'd be like, this is all it wants to show me because you have one. That's his power though. He could lead a cult. Like, definitely. Something Pinterest is getting right. Pinterest is like, yeah, oh, for you interest in this? We know what you want. <laughs> Just send you every angle, yeah. every picture we can. <laughs> um, we talked about, like, cults, like, fandom and stuff, and that's, like, a very positive relationship with a cult-like thing. But when you're reading the book, it's kind of implied that Lowe's life was motivated to, be, to stay in the cult. Um, is this just like a mask for her fear of losing Low, Or like what other layers are there in this? Is it about religion, grief? Oh my god, it's about everything. I mean, it's <laughs> a, they're, they're such broken characters in so many different ways. It's just like an onion of tragedy. Um, and <laughs> I think, you know, I think like B really believed in Lev's miracle and he promised her that they would meet again. And I think she had just, you know, once you think someone can bring people back from the dead, what's to stop you from believing that they could like strike them down and kill them too? But I don't think B thought that Lev would do that. I think she just felt so wholly indebted to him that she could wait for her sister. Like she was always sure they would be together again on Lev's terms, which were God's terms, and God had shown her a miracle and brought her sister back. So, of course, you you don't just be like, okay, God, you might want this, but I, a mortal, will refuse. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, so I think she felt very bound to, like, the rules he had established because the proof was low-lived. These poor people. <laughs> I think that was something so interesting with Lev in general, but also sort of the way cults were perceived. And this is one of my favorite questions to ask because I do love asking things where I'm like, did I read into something that was there or was it not there? And I was just like making things up as I went along. Um, but I thought <laughs> in terms of like representations of cult leaders that there were almost a couple of different kinds in there. 
um, of the ways people can start, feel sort of like indebted to this like larger than life figure. And Lev feels like a really extreme version. And even a lot of the references to uh, the current political th things that yeah. were going on in the world, like definitely some maybe some president references in there that we can yes. assume. Um, but even just Lowe's boss, and maybe this is from being in the tech industry a little bit too, just right. felt like a different version of a cult leader. He was, you're right. Like he was obviously, he was meant to contrast Lev and that he was, well, he wasn't, I mean, I really like Paul in a general sense because I fan casted him as Chris Evans with a beard. But <laughs> <laughs> that aside, um, you know, he's, he's, he's kind of oblivious. He's very entitled. He's got a lot of privilege and he hires low and she thinks somebody finally sees me. Someone believes in me. Then he brings her into this job and he's like, you're never going to advance. So she's like, huh, well, how about that? <laughs> so then you've got Lev, who she's totally skeptical of and, and wants to take down. And he's the first person who says, I believe in you and I think you can go places and I want to help you get there. So I think Paul is really, he could be a cult leader, but I also think in some ways he's sort of representative of, of like us societally. Like how are we complicit in situations that can drive people to uh, want to be in a cult like I know people are totally responsible for their own decisions and you know with the caveat that when someone's being emotionally manipulated that's like there's a certain level of it that is out of their control we all have you know we all play a part like when someone's in a cult and they want to get out and we're like you joined a cult you fool like does that really help them get out at all you know so I think Paul is like sort of representative of a of a culture that sort of drives people away and prevents them from coming back and and but he could have just as easily been on the wrong side of that too well he wasn't on the right side the way i just described it Poor Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but he I looks mean, amazing I... <laughs> <laughs> again i like having this picture as well so much of him <laughs> because i did also like him i just thought like it was very interesting the way i get there were kind of felt like there were parallels between Lowe he definitely and him. was yeah, um, but also Chris Evans with a bear beard. Like, we've yeah. seen him with a beard. I know exactly what that is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this got me through the novel. I'm just like, okay, this is going to be tough to write, so I should at least enjoy what I'm imagining. <laughs> Did you fan cast anybody else? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> and I did have uh, actors for um, Lo and B and Casey. Oh, 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 Foster. Well, wait, that's another dude. But Foster was supposed to look like the guy from the Lumineers. <laughs> oh, I can see that. I can yeah. see that. Yeah. A lot. Yeah. Look, oh, I wish I, I feel like, man, I've given something of myself away here. It's like, yeah, I can tell you exactly who all the guys are. But B, no, but B and Lo, they were, oh, B was, um, oh, I love her, but I can't think of her name. So I must really love her. You know, she was in, um, the movie with the Harley, Harley Quinn, or Harley Quinn. Harley oh, Quinn. oh, Margot um, Robbie? No, it's uh, she was brunette and she was like, um, oh, she's in the thing, but I don't think anyone's the thing remake. Mary, Mary Winstead, Mary Winstead, Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Okay, oh. I forget the name of everyone that wasn't Margot Robbie in that. I know, she's like who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she and she was in um, uh, uh, you know, something destroys the world. Oh God, Scott Pilgrim remember. versus the world. Yeah, Scott Pilgrim versus yeah. the world. So that was definitely B in my head, and Casey. Um, oh, who was the redhead? Because I, I kind of like got it like a Jessica Chastain vibe for her, but like Casey's younger than that, so it didn't quite work. But I, I constantly kind of pictured that for her. Lo was an unknown actress or an actress that was just starting out. I have a harder time, like, um, because to me, B was like a, even though she had a perspective, she was like a peripheral character, so it was easier to assign her a face. But like with Lo, I was right in her head, and the more in, in their head that I am, the harder it is for me to cast them, because mm -hmm. it's like internal, and I don't want to like super associate that. Yeah, because it's easier for me to cast the characters around the main character, but it's mm -hmm. harder for me to figure out someone for the lead. So I did cast other people. <laughs> what I love, though, is this really fits into our podcast normally, because every time we're recording, we have like eight IMDb tabs open. We're like, <laughs> what? <laughs> they were in the thing, you know, and then also that one. And then someone will say Adrian Brody, and it'll be like, no, not him, <laughs> but a different Brody, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I was. I promised myself I would never say who I cast for who in this thing because it would just look like the, I was like the most superficial book development ever, and you got it out of me. So, <laughs> <congratulations>. <laughs>
<laughs> it started honestly that's what the keith ranieri thing was it was a tease i was like please give me a different image and then i was so bad was like, we pulled it out <laughs> i was like i can't leave her with this this is too bad and i can't leave my book with this i feel like my book is undefended my cult leader is undefended because <laughs> he, he needed a lot of defending <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <laughs> and then going through that um because you were doing i mean so much research on who to cast but also <laughs> while researching um cults and things like that for this book was there anything particularly surprising that you sort of found as you were researching every time you like think it can't get worse it does with cults which is one of those things it's like wow this is just getting progressively more traumatic for everybody involved and uh it's actually not what it was in the cult itself. It was after, like, it, because my research was, like, um, uh, People's Temple was central to my research. I Something that really got to me in a way that I wasn't expecting was when I, I, I started out watching, like, I just, like, I dove into all these names and, and the history of the cult. And it was, like, almost so much going on at once that it, it sort of depersonalized the whole history of the cult for me. And then as I, you know, gradually, Really just kept falling in and recognizing names and people and their and and everything started getting a little bit more familiar the more I read. It just occurred to me at one point deep into the research process that these survivors were constantly re-traumatizing themselves in hopes that the people they were sharing their story with, like the media, people like you and me, that they would be seen as more than cultists. And that is so much the backbone of the project because I just find that absolutely devastating. I think it speaks to a real, a real shortcoming in, in terms of empathy and the way we relate to people who are going through these things. I just, and and as soon as that switch went on, it wasn't too, it, like it was deep into the research process, but it was early in the draft. I, every time that I would read about Jonestown, I would like, I would just cry. Like I would get like, the first time you read it, it feels very clinical. Like you hear about these thousand people that died in the in the jungle and you hear that they like that they got injected with cyanide and then a bunch of kool-aid jokes it's just all very like you know you get desensitized to these kind of things and then the more you read the more familiar it becomes the more human the story becomes the more devastating it becomes but what i found the most devastating about it like beyond the tragic events themselves is that people were appealing for their humanity and they had already suffered so much it's a bummer man like just to think that people have to beg you to see them but we, but we like intrinsically reject things that we don't want to see ourselves as part of. Because I think everyone would join a cult. Like that's what I've arrived at with this book. Mm -hmm. Do you think you join a cult? Because oh, I, I just told you you would. Uh, <laughs> yes. We've talked about this before, yeah. and I was yeah. like, catch me at a bad time. A hundred percent. hundred percent. You would. I would be like, yeah, for sure. I'm going to join this group of people that is trying to make me better. Like I hundred percent right. like happening for okay. me. And then Christina has to get me out. <laughs> that can't be me because I'd get stuck yeah, too. Yeah, that would be in there. I love this. It's all on you, Christina. <laughs> that was absolutely where this uh, landed. And it was that I'm not getting in your, involved in your business. I'm not taking risks. Uh, I'm very sorry. I hope you get Good out. Good luck to you. Oh my but, God. Uh, sp again, speaking of Nexium, I'm not like that girl that knew Prince Charles. I don't think I have the connections to get you out. <laughs> What do you mean your your cousin is an a uh, Prince Charles? This got dark, man. <laughs> we in anticipation of this book, we talked about this specific thing. Two of you are in a cult, and one of you definitely wouldn't save the other two. That's that's wow. Gotta so, be realistic about what you can do. What is, who's going to help if three of us are in a cult? Well, this is like the Hunger Games conversation where I'd be like with my sister, "Would you volunteer as tribute?" And she's like, "No." <laughs> Why would I do that for you? I, I've got stuff I want to live for, Courtney. It's like, well, thanks. Well, I know my older sister would never do that, like Hunger Games style. Because yeah. we, we both know I would have the better chance of survival. So, like, I'm thinking about it that way. Would my sister join a cult with me? I sold it, probably. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're pretty similar. Stephanie's making plans to bring additional people into this cult. This is I like this. It's an MLA. This, it's it's a, left. this it's, is why she needs to be left. <laughs> you ever think about how like little it would take too? I'm just like thinking if I was really tired and you wanted to make dinner for me. <laughs> like, sometimes you're just so overwhelmed. It's like the first person that shows you that little piece of kindness and makes you dinner. Yeah. That's the scam of adulthood is making your own dinner, by the way. I've been talking about that a lot on Twitter. Really makes me mad. <laughs> Especially you... right now, doing dishes every single day, deciding yes! what to eat every single day, multiple times. It's so much. I'm not okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I got to do it. But it's like, if someone wanted to do it for me, that would be fine. And if they just happened to be in a cult, I guess. What are you going to do? The price I pay. (laughs) (laughs) And I think, I mean, I think the project did a really, really good job of portraying how easy something like that is to fall into and how it really can be anybody sort of no matter what preconceived notions you're thinking of. Um, and I know you actually wrote something about this on Instagram. Yes. <laughs> um, just to be like, this is a genuinely like very beautiful um, comment about like empathy and things you will go through. And it's in this like Instagram comment, which I love. Um, <laughs> and I, I think that was such an important element in the book. And I think, again, it was just done really well. Of Thank you. Going in with that thought process of like, how does this happen? But then the whole time, even just listening to B's story it makes so much sense. And it's hard not to feel for her when you're going with her being like, she just lost so much. Like, of course she fell into this. There's like a whole history. Like those characters start the story with uh, an incredible amount of trauma. And I've been really fascinated by early responses because not everyone, but like some people just really don't want to contextualize that. I mean, that's it, right? They don't have to read it the way I want them to. Like, I mean, if everyone read a book the way that I wrote the way I wanted to, I'd be like the most celebrated author on earth. <laughs> um, but um, so much of what they do and how they exist is defined by their trauma. And I know that, I mean, it's kind of spoilery. Spoiler! Spoiler. Um, you know, like, low, it, it feels like a sudden, a sudden flip, right? It feels very, oh. But she's at a point where she's been, Like, in my mind, she's been trying to join the project since it took B from her. Like, what she can't be part of, she wanted to destroy, but now she's the opportunity to be part of it. And in the, um, I was really, I'm really excited about the Barnes & Noble exclusive because there's a bonus chapter in there that kind of goes in deep on that and and what Lev does to his other members. I can't talk about it, but it's it's just like, I I just feel like Lo has been leading up to that moment her whole life. And, And when she does decide to join, she's like, She's about to lose everything again. She thinks she's going to. So she's like grasping on to what's left. Poor Lil. But I just think it's interesting how, I think it, especially with like female characters, it's easy to like decontextualize their trauma just to make, you know, if you're frustrated with them. And I always write frustrating characters. So the, I always have the the good fortune of getting a, a very small subset of readers who, who like to victim blame them. But it's not all my readers. I'm not like picking on like, you're allowed to not like my books. It's fine. I love my books. That's all that matters. Now. But, you know, it's it's interesting, especially when you're writing books about traumatized women and, and it's a, a commentary against this kind of response. And then that's the response you get. It's like, oh, nuts. <laughs> a traumatized person isn't going to respond the way a person wants, like the reader right? is reading something real, right? Like this is something that people actually go through. And I think that's what I enjoy most about it, even though like, I'm frustrated with a character I know that like I don't know how I would respond in a certain situation maybe I would respond the same way maybe I would respond even worse (laughs) nobody considers they'd make an even worse choice right they're like I'd be better but like you could go in and you could you know mess this up even worse than low like there's a lot you could do wrong and some people would get it right but yeah there's a there's a I think what's going to be really interesting when the project comes out is it purposefully denies the sensationalism of cults. Like I think some people are really expecting a spectacle and they're going to be mm-hmm. upset that it, I don't know, that it doesn't end up in flames, which is, you know, historically a lot of cults do. But I I really want people, like with Sadie, it was like, I want you to think about the media that you're consuming and why you're consuming it. Like it's not an indictment that you like true crime, but just think about how we binge content that at the center of it is usually a woman who has been brutally assaulted or has an act of violence committed against her. So with the project, to me, it's like if you entered into this book and you wanted a spectacle and you feel cheated of a spectacle, like why is that? Because that's interesting. Because I'm trying to tell you something human, but if, if you just wanted like a sideshow that make you feel good about yourself at the end of the day, interesting. Like, and it's fine. Like, that's uh, like every response is valid. I just, I want to, I want to push. I love pushing at readers. I love challenging them and making them upset. I mean, I hope I am. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Thank <Yeah>. you. <laughs> I, that's one of the things I, I loved about your books and starting reading them is they very much sometimes feel almost like looking at like a broken mirror. Oh, I like that. Oh, I got I gotta put that somewhere. <laughs> I was gonna expand on it, but I'm like, there's a sentence. I don't know how else to explain it. Like it, it there's something about that it that good. just feels very real. Um, and like a, a good reflection, um, to just like sit and think about 
the way those characters are written and this this book the same was very much like that because I am definitely somebody who watches a lot of things and I'm always the person to be like how could you do this how did you end up in this situation like what is going on but with the project it felt like I understood every event that took place I understood well, why you. everyone made those choices it made sense um one of the reasons really- that I, I thought yeah, yeah. <laughs> It made sense. That's the best. Uh, That's, that is actually that is the best compliment. Honestly, it made it, it, the sentences held up, and they all meant something. <laughs> <laughs> Truly, though. <laughs> but then speaking of that, and this is one thing I, I had to ask too, because one thing that I love, um, in addition to your books, is also your Twitter. Oh, thank you. <laughs> we talk all the time. I think about. I think it was years ago that Steph sent something where you were talking about Sadie, and you sent out a tweet that was like, "If for everybody who has like these negative criticisms about Sadie, for people that are sending out these uh, like negative reviews about these things, please make sure you use the hashtag yeah. Sadie. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we need these for the engagement numbers. Like, well, it's yeah. fine. Just like keep it going. <laughs> perception matters you know like maybe they're not gonna look at the caption that where you say you hate the book but look at all these pretty pictures of Sadie like we're on the game aren't we no. <laughs> I love that energy so much and I loved it so much just reading the dedication for this book <laughs> um where it was just this one's for me I was like oh, I love this <laughs> thank you what I- made you decide on this <laughs> well I think I'm pretty great someone should have dedicated a book to me a long time ago and then what others won't do for you you do for yourself (laughs) (laughs) basically um I mean and to to that extent I mean like I guess the more serious answer is though I do think I'm really great the project was really hard because Sadie was my breakout book and that was six books into my career and it's like okay now I gotta follow that up great That's that's a thrilling adventure of intense pressure and, and a lot of anxiety. And so when I when I wrote the project, the first draft was 400 pages. And I, I don't write big books like they're all pretty compact. And it was uh, it was bad. It was so bad that I was like to my editor, no, we're not doing it. I'm pulling it. And she wouldn't let me. And I was like, OK, we can try this again, but I don't want to do it. And then I did it and I loved it. And I was like, thanks to my editor. This one's for me. (laughs) Really should be for her when I think when I put it that way. But you know, I got distracted by my own reflection as usual. You did the work. (laughs) You made it. She did a lot of it too, though, because she had to deal with me while I was doing the work. And that is not a small thing. I know everyone thinks I'm a delight, but I'm not. (laughs) I mean, we're not gonna, we'll dedicate this episode of the podcast for you too. So you'll have a book and a podcast. (gasps) We just need to keep the list going. Like how many things can we get dedicated to Courtney Summers? Does anyone like getting married? Dedicate your wedding to me? Put me in your vows? I mean, I deserve it. I deserve it. (laughs) It's what she deserves. Okay. (laughs) Uh, So we'll move on to... Why? Why are we moving on from talking about it? Oh, no, it's going to be not. <laughs> it's, it's still good. It's still good. Okay, okay. Um, so I think you said an, you liked it was an onion of trauma. Did I make that up? It was an onion I, of layers or something. A layers of an onion of tragedy trauma. I mean, it yes. all works. Yes. Sadness. So that's, that's often a theme uh, in your books that we've found. Um, is that <laughs> Thank something God. that... God. <laughs> is that a topic you specifically like set out to write or do you just love hurting your readers, i.e. us? I mean, I do love to hurt my readers because the books I write, like they're, I'm generally good at compartmentalizing, but they're hard to write and they put me through it. So I think it's only fair that I should put you through it. But um, like the serious answer and the more, I guess, sincere answer is that, though I do like to hurt people with my work, is that, you know, I write about stuff that outrage, like it, like violence against women, the way we fall short, victims and survivors, these are persistent themes in my work because they make me so mad and I, I i want my work to feel like a confrontation i want readers to feel as similarly as outraged as i do after they're done you know picking the pieces of themselves up off the floor because it made them so sad and i and i want them to kind of look at my books and be like is seriously this is what the world's like and then I, and then i want them to really like refuse to accept it i want them to move through the world refusing what i've handed them because they they think it can be better and they can be part of what makes it better I don't know if they will, but I mean, it's a nice thought. Otherwise, what am I doing this to myself for? <laughs> I want to make people mad for about good, um, for good reason, not about good things because those are terrible things, but like for good reasons. Channel that outrage, make a change. Whenever I read your books, I'm always lightly devastated for a few days afterwards. Um, <laughs> so, which do you have a 
one book that you wrote that you find emotionally devastating the most or are all of them or is there a favorite of your work um when you look oh, back man. I think they all they all devastate me for different reasons I I think hmm. you know Sadie was like the the first time that I ever wrote a book where a girl wasn't standing at the end of it which is a sad thing to say but it it was <laughs> man she had I had to make a point for Sadie oh god yeah that hurt me I guess I, I got <laughs> to the end of that book I did it kind of made me cry and then I don't usually cry about my work like I I just I bury it and 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 write it and and then like later I think about it and I'm like oh poor Sadie I remember yeah. talking to you about it <laughs> yeah. and then you were talking about the ending and I could see, I heard myself get devastated. <laughs> I was like, so like, like maybe there's an optimistic ending. I I mean, like, it... <laughs> <laughs> I and then you know, listening back, I'm like, no. Yeah. Well, it's a <laughs> couple of years. Like, it's so weird because people are like, well, what happened at the end of Sadie? And it's, and, and, and once you release the book, like, you've got to give it time to not be so spoilery. And it's like, is it okay to talk about now? Like what happened to Sadie? What do we think happened to Sadie? One of the worst things someone a reader finally got me, and I guess this is spoilery if you haven't read Sadie, and if you haven't read Sadie, God, get out of here. <laughs> um, um, I was I was just on Twitter innocently minding my business, and someone said, "Courtney, what if Sadie died thinking she failed?" I was like, "You're a bad person." <laughs> I was like, "That's the worst thing anyone has ever said to me. Congratulations." <laughs> And I think about it a lot. So yeah, it was Sadie's. I mean, they're all devastating in different ways, but that was a, a unique experience. Christina did say that I had read the book, like I think a good six months before it came out. So I was devastated the first time. And then of course it came out and everybody was reading it or doing the audiobook and like re-traumatizing me. <laughs> so I feel like I went through it quite a few times. Like I did not get over Sadie for oh, a no! full year. That's awful. I mean, my editor is like, you know, you could be optimistic about it. Like, you know, there's always a possibility. And I was like, <laughs> do I look like an optimist to you, Sarah? Like, does my whole body of work seem uh, like it's steeped in optimism? <laughs> I'm like looking at my shelves of your books and I'm like, you know, I, the one that's my favorite is Some Girls Are. And I'm like, that's because it has the optimistic ending <laughs> compared to all the other ones. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. And I understand myself so well now optimistic like in the sense that like they both like, get out inside the high school and they're like we're gonna graduate soon it's fine they're both alive i guess that's the yeah point. they're both yeah. alive that's it oh, <laughs> like, man. oh man that book i i just reread it and i was like man those girls were mean i was in i was in the thick of it at the time and i was like could they be meaner at my editor and i think she was just like am i editing like uh, someone that's something's wrong with you fundamentally Courtney like they're mean enough it's fine but I was never like this was taken too far I'm like no checks out girls can yeah. be Woof. <laughs> like honestly I was just yeah but yeah I was just thinking about that one because it was so again the girls were so mean but in such a like realistic way like I feel like you never see violent girls in that way it's always very like I mean, emotionally like, trauma and in this one they're like actively <laughs> violent with each other school is like like oh man i mean i can i i i have never felt such like i don't know if i should say this actually like when i was like thick in my mean girl stuff in my school days I, like i i was so angry like i often wished that I had like an outlet that could be violent, like because you you don't get to punch each other when you're girls. It's it's just I mean punching people is generally frowned upon anyway. But you're denied access to like your anger, and even in healthy ways, because you're just not allowed to be angry. But I just remember like I I don't think I've ever been as angry in my life than I have during that period of my life when all us girls were just like figuring out what brand new ways to torture each other, and it's just it's just so. It's sad. It's the patriarchy is the thing. It is. It's 100% the patriarchy. And we're beating each other up for that. Oh, everything's a tragedy. Oh, man. It feels <laughs> okay. like such a good tagline for all of these books. Everything's a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll bring it back to lighter topics. In one of my... Is that possible? Like, <laughs> I, mean, cool. I mean, now that I'm thinking more about it uh youtube so like we know you will enjoy the occasional <laughs> youtube beauty video who doesn't um 
maybe I, maybe instead of talking about Tati, because like her fall from being like one of my favorites was pretty drastic. In it the was last year. Um, thoughts on her? Thoughts on Tati James Jeffrey Star? Is there someone else we should be watching? Because I mean, I have free time. <laughs> I, need, <laughs> I need to up my catalog. <laughs> I they love all are kind of like high school mean girls, but just like still. It as is. Yeah. So it does flow. It's intense. <laughs> it's intense. Like um, one thing that really struck me about the whole um, Jeffree Star, um, James Charles, Tati, Tati Sega. Uh, did you watch like her second video about it where she said oh, yeah. like she was Shane <laughs> Dawson? Yeah, <laughs> many times <laughs> when she said Shane Dawson said he was an empath and he oh. could like see her soul or something like that and i was like this is like the project this that like full-on creeped me out i was like i i don't know i just i don't have the kind of friends there's like i think you're like i'm an empath and i i I can tell you're destined for greatness like no one has ever said that to my face in my friend group i mean and if they did i don't think they'd be like serious about it (laughs) like but like you could just kind of see that there was a whole world in that world that's a, a on a whole other level yeah the like backstabbing not even backstabbing yeah. blackmail and they're like i'm afraid of jeffree star like f- I took it to a level i didn't expect it was everyone sounded like they were afraid for their lives yeah and he was like i moved because i was afraid for my life i'm like this is supposed to be makeup like this is- <laughs> i watch it i like i watch beauty gurus because that's like the fun thing and then suddenly it got really really dark and that was like such a line for all of them too. I was in a dark place, and it's like, what is going on over there? Like, I don't, know, I don't understand. It's just makeup. It is just makeup. Like, I don't get. But there's, I guess, you know, there's so much that maybe if I had like 15 million followers, I'd feel like I had a lot to lose. But I still don't. I don't know. I don't think I could. I, I, I would be stressed out all the time. I'm already stressed out. I could not be that stressed out all the time i like um nima tang she's a good um beauty guru who else i like i've also been like watching the drama channels about the stuff to keep on on track so i like watching peter mon's take on things and uh who else who else now i'm more into like food tube food tube yeah like um i've gone into yeah (laughs) (laughs) like um mike mike chen he does strictly dumpling and he always my parents are obsessed. Oh my god. <laughs> <with him. laughs> he's so much fun. I love seeing all the new things he's trying. And it's like and it's like I can't go anywhere, so I enjoy that. Especially like when he goes for a while there he was doing like first class flight food reviews and mm-hmm. I was like, This is fascinating and then he like goes into seven elevens in different countries and I'm like, Why do all our seven eleven like wait wait, we don't have seven elevens, do we? But our convenience stores do not compare. Do we not have we do. We do. We do? I not don't. as good you as you live in the Korea. city, I guess. Yeah, they have There's like... one in Toronto. <laughs> no. So unfair. Do they have like fancy sandwiches though? And like, because these 7 Elevens are like out of this world. I'm assuming no, because it's, I like, I, I always just think of it as the gas station where you can get a Slurpee. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then it's not living up to its full potential. And that's <laughs> also a tragedy, bringing it back around to tragedy. <laughs> and, and binging with Babish and, and, um, oh. Yeah, and they have Sola there from um, Bon Appetit, was it? Yeah, yeah. Bon Appetit. What a what a huge Sola yeah. fan. She's so she's so cool. I love her. She's just oh, she's got such a good energy. It makes me happy to watch her. What else? Who else do I like on YouTube? I think that's like it. It's just like I like I can't believe you came for me like that. My my parents love strictly dumpling i mean i'm also there watching it with them okay so. good. <laughs> they found him before me though so the credit goes to them which i'm <laughs> shocked that they did find and then my sister was like should we get them like a cameo for him saying like my oh my god <laughs> and I was at like, the height of the pandemic i was like really looking into um the cameos i'm like do i need something that makes me feel happy inside and is it a cameo there was this um Oh, I can't remember. Um, James Manfield, Mansfield from uh, RuPaul's Drag Race. Anyway, she has great cameos, and they she had like a pep a peppy one for um, someone who was really sad during the uh, the start of this whole thing, the whole pandemic quarantine. I was like, I want one, but I didn't get one. Another tragedy. Somebody should have dedicated one to you. Exactly. <laughs> this whole episode is like a whole like. Is it a warning? Is it a what are we doing here? What message are we sending? Anything. 
I mean, there is a warning because a cult did engage with Nat on oh, yeah. TikTok. <laughs> what? And the yeah. whole time we were like, Nat, why are you engaging? Why are you replying back? Pull back, Nat. Nat, <laughs> don't do it. Be strong. <laughs> the cult leader engaged with me. Excuse me. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? What was the cult called? Unicult, I think. Oh wait, it's have I heard TikTok of this cult? To- yeah, oh, it's wait, a TikTok okay. cult. It's like um, I, what do they call themselves? They call themselves Star Seeds, I think. Oh my God, yeah. They like they think that everyone is like an alien connected to the internet or something like that. It's. <laughs> It, it, I don't it's even know. It's on. everything. Everything points wow. to it's like almost like advanced Scientology. I would call it or like. And you applied? Oh, it, I was the one that initiated. <laughs> 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 I okay. I found their like their merch on Etsy, <laughs> and I really <laughs> liked their like cool like. <laughs> what was it like their cult cloak or whatever it was like this oh my robe. god it's this beautiful white robe with like a rainbow <laughs> thing on it with like a little unicorn thing and i was like do i really want <laughs> this cult robe and she's like yeah buy it and i was like what is happening <laughs> <laughs> i love like, this i saw your so- merch i'd like to know more about your cult Thank yeah you. i think i think like one of her merch items is she was selling a piece of her hair for like five thousand dollars and i was like this is wild. <laughs> you think she has yeah. an OnlyFans? <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I'm just curious. Like, I feel like that's a niche a cult would do well with. There's... Oh my god, I'm thinking of new ideas. <laughs> <laughs> you know, how my cult, like the Unity Project, feels like hopelessly out of date. Like, <laughs> they were barely on the internet. They did things in person, and they could have just been selling Lev's hair this whole time. <laughs> like, Lev has exactly. an OnlyFans. <laughs> that would have, like, Saved everyone a lot of time. Oh my god, Lev's OnlyFans. I would be. <laughs> oh my god! I could see it. I could see it happening 110%. If he looks like Oscar Isaac, especially. <laughs> yeah. This this conversation has gone some places that I do not endorse or condone. This is on everyone but their sister and their sister, and that's that. It's my fault, and you can blame me. <laughs> Do you think there's something wild though about the idea of Nat being like one of the first people to get involved with the cult because of the clothes? I mean, <laughs> looking, traditionally you look at the uniforms and you're like, hmm, really? All right, that's a choice. <laughs> this time it was like, yes, that no, it's truly it's this choice. It's the, I, I want the clothes. Like that's that's a good story though. I mean, it's only a good story from this side of it. If you had joined the cult and there was no Nat at the podcast, this would be a very <laughs> This would be a really heavy podcast. <laughs> we would like to talk about the cult book and then about the friend we lost to the cult. Like, <laughs> we'd still tie it in though, marketing wise. <laughs> it did though, but it just proves we're all on that line. Nat more so than anyone else here. It's true. <laughs> and I think I'm on the line. I just didn't know that like you were really on the line. <laughs> That's generally how we sport it out. Nat, cult, Steph, MLM. Honestly, if I if I wasn't so lazy, I probably would have put an application in at some point. <laughs> you know yourself. Like it's good to know yourself. <laughs> Just don't find a cult that knows you that well too, because they'll find a way to work with that. They will. Oh, no. You're gonna get emails after this, be like, we think you'd be perfect for yeah. this opportunity, and you don't and you don't have to do any work. We'll do it for you. <laughs> we'll send you I... hair for free. <laughs> that just occurred to me. What if you are engaged with cults now after releasing this book? Oh my god! Like in what way? Like I join one, and like and everyone's like, "Well, we could have we saw that coming." And she released a book about it. Like, like I'm just picturing the unicult. They're like big on being called a cult. They like fully support it. They're like, "Yes, we're cults. <laughs> cults aren't as bad as you think they are," which is a certain stance to take. But now I'm picturing like what, now, and suddenly they're reaching out to you. They're like, "We think you wrote a really great book. You want to talk more?" <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Wow, I'm look at me. I'm like, I sh- my auto answer should be no. But I'm so interested in cults now. I'm like, try me. <laughs> like that's bad. <laughs> every You're which like, way i'm like walking myself into this situation it's like i fully admit that i think i could be vulnerable enough to be like lured into a cult but now they're like the guys of my like if, i don't know man i'll be really interested to see if that happens and then um if you get an sos or something 
everyone but Christina will come for me. <laughs> it's true. And then the rest of us will get stuck with you. It's fine. We'll be in there together. As long as we're not alone, it's fine. <laughs> this podcast becomes very different. Every episode is just me like, here's a list of all the people we've lost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll tell their stories. <laughs> Um, not really related, but kind of related because you're talking about how you're so interested. But are you currently writing something else? Yeah, I am. Ooh. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, it's got a um, it's got a very tight um turnaround. So, Ooh. well, I'm doing like everything but writing it. It's like, oh, you need this soon. Like, I'm sure there's five thousand other things I could be doing. So <laughs> that's that's. I feel like I'm. Do you are you like are you one of those people? Are you all one of those people that like has to work to a deadline? So it's like the more time you have, you won't do it. And then right down to the crunch, you're like, oh, I'm here now. I'm stuck. I have to do it. And and it's very bad for you. I absolutely need a deadline. <laughs> this podcast is often edited on Monday nights. <laughs> and then frantic messages in a group chat. Can somebody please write a description? Can someone please check to make sure it's good? This bodes well for us, doesn't it? <laughs> And then, oh, you know, the book comes out Tuesday. So, yeah, this is like a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We were like, we'll give ourselves enough time and then we'll see what happens. (laughs) (laughs) We'll watch the time go by. That's it. (laughs) Look, it's passing. We'll give ourselves enough time to get us here again. (laughs) Time is a flat circle. Yeah. What is time? What is, what day is it? What time is it? Time is is nothing now. Oh, my God. I don't, I don't. I mean, I want to keep aging because that means I'm alive. But, like, what is aging in a pandemic? Like, it's, it's just... I think it's only good because we're not going on the sun. I thought about this. We're not going on the sun as much. True, true. Uh, like, we're washing our hair less, so our hair's becoming better. Uh, less makeup. <laughs> <laughs> I've really thought about this. <laughs> There's got to be a good side. But then we're not, like, we're not getting vitamin D. I mean, well, maybe you are if you open the windows, but I don't like to do that. Also, that? the stress yes. is aging some of us. Oh, shit. That's true. <laughs> That's like... like, our skin might be fine, but mentally. Mentally, <laughs> yeah. Mentally, we're aged. A few minutes later. We just want to thank you so much, Courtney, for joining us. We were so happy to have you here and get a chance to talk to you about the project, your other books, about YouTube, <laughs> and <laughs> YouTube in particular. So just thank you so much for co- coming on. Thank you so much for having me. I'm glad that, um, well, I'm not. Glad to find out the two of you would join a cult and one of you wouldn't say the other two. <laughs> this has been a very revealing podcast on many levels, and I hope that's the takeaway. Christina wouldn't save you. <laughs> I, people should know what they're getting into. I don't lie. Yeah, I think that's fair. <laughs> this right, is a thank- lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was so fun to have you on. Thank you guys so much for listening. Thank you so much to Courtney Summers for joining in this episode. I think it's literally... Uh, a surprise dream for us every time she responded back to our emails we're like oh my god she knows we're alive Uh, so we were just so excited that she got a chance to join us and we got a chance to talk to her about the project we all really really love the book we thought it was great we definitely think that you should read it Um, and like we've said before it releases today February 2nd go out grab the book read it be devastated with us Um, and then also I'm not even going to plug Uh, I'm going to plug our Twitter and Instagram, but you should definitely go to her Twitter because it's fire. Uh, You can find us at EatsCast on uh, Instagram and Twitter. We'll have lots of links and retweets to Courtney Summers' Twitter as well. So we highly recommend you check that out. You can find us on Pinterest at everyone and their sister pod. For those of you who don't know, Pinterest is a great place to go to make mood boards for your future (laughs) book. Highly recommend. Uh, And thanks so much for listening. Reach out to us online and let us know what you thought of the book. Also, if you're talking about the book, remember to use the hashtag welcome to the project. And if you want to learn how to self-promote, take everything you learn from Courtney Summers' Twitter and apply it to yourself. The year 2021 is dedicated to not just Courtney Summers, but Courtney Summers' in, like Twitter presence and acknowledgement of how great she is. Like We love the love for herself that is 1000% justified. Her tall person energy, if you will. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much. And we'll see you next week. Bye. 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 Who's a cannibal in 2021? That's not true. (laughs) But yeah, revoke a pasta pass. Plausible. I believe it. And here we are. (laughs)